Natalie, thank you so much for coming on the Easy Prey podcast today. Thank you so much for having me. Looking forward to this. So can you give myself and the audience a little bit of background about who you are and what you do? Sure. I host the Coin Stories podcast, which focuses on the intersection of Bitcoin and macro and global economics. And I really just want to help the general audience understand this very new technology. I remember being very new to Bitcoin in about 2017 is when I first heard about it. And I was just like most people, I was like, okay, well, this is digital. So clearly it can be hacked. I don't want to put too much of my money in it. Um, and I, I really didn't understand not only how Bitcoin and crypto worked, but I didn't really understand money because we don't have good financial literacy in America, unfortunately. And yeah. I I studied really hard. I was a good student and I did all the AP classes and I, ne I never learned things like what money printing is and why we went off the gold standard and what the impact of that is and how fractional reserve banking works. So um, I had to go on really a, a, a knowledge journey when I learned about Bitcoin. And now several years later, um, I'm really focused on it. My background's actually media. Uh, I was a journalist for more than 10 years and I was reporting on all of the things that I feel like now are reaching a really deep inflection point in our country, the growing cost of living, people not feeling like they can catch up, uh, young people feeling like they'll never be able to afford a house or assets, um, and just kind of our society pulling apart and becoming more polarized mm -hmm. and frustrated and people dealing with a lot of um, spiritual and mental health issues. And all of it really is connected to money and, and this lack of hope and dignity. And so when I found Bitcoin, it was also... A real transformation for me because I went from not having a lot of hope in the future um, to having a lot of hope. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I dedicate all my time and I'm using my media skills to now focus on Bitcoin education. That's awesome. And and while this is uh, our conversation is going to be a little bit different than most of your conversations uh, about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, you're you're not the uh, you're not necessarily leading the charge on <laughs> anti scams and whatnot. But let's kind of talk about kind of the, the the risks, the rewards, a little bit of those ebbs and flows, some of those scams and some of the, the, the things that people are going to watch out for. So sure. what are some of the, 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 the pros and cons or the risks and rewards of Bitcoin? Well, I guess we can start with the risks of the overall crypto industry, um, because it did take me a while to understand that Bitcoin is so unique and special and very different from crypto, which is why we sort of have a, a saying in this space, it's Bitcoin, not crypto. Many of your um, audience members might have heard about the crypto implosions, everything from Celsius to FTX to BlockFi, uh, basically imploding over the last two years and running away with customers' money, which is, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's really disappointing to see. And I do believe in in free markets, right? And they sort of regulate themselves. But I don't want anyone losing their money because they trusted the wrong place and because nefarious bad actors basically promised one thing and did something else behind the scenes. And so what I like to tell people is that this is not very different from the early internet days. Mm -hmm. And and when, when it comes to the internet, anyone can spin up a website, right? Anyone yeah. can go on there. I mean, today it's easier than ever. You don't even have to be a coder. You can go on <laughs> one of these you know, easy platforms and just spin up a website. Well, it's very similar um, in the crypto world. Anyone can create and issue one of these tokens. And so that's why we see 20 plus thousand of them on oh, the wow. market. Uh, and Bitcoin is very unique and different because it's a commodity, which means it has no issuer. There's no team behind it that can influence the protocol um, and the and the technology network and what's going to happen to it in several years or how many tokens are going to be issued. Is it going to be more? Is it going to be less? Mm -hmm. It's immune to change, which is why it's so beautiful. Whereas most of the other cryptocurrencies are securities. There's an issuer, there's a team or a group of people behind it that can influence the protocol. Uh, many times they have issued themselves a lot of coins in an initial coin offering, and then they sold the rest to the public. So, I mean, it's very much like issuing a stock, which yeah. is why the SEC has so many uh, issues with it. And unfortunately, a lot of these companies also operated offshore. So very opaque. You don't know what's going on. Um, so I, I really urge people to be careful with crypto because mm -hmm. a lot of the tokens are scams. With Bitcoin, actually, I know that this might sound surprising if your audience is not familiar with Bitcoin. I actually see it as one of the most conservative 
uh, long-term investments that you can make. I know it's volatile in the short term and you see these price swings and it looks like a heart monitor. Uh, but when you zoom out, um, the price performance is actually, it's it's beaten out almost every other investment you could have made. And I think it's one of the safest places, especially if you know how to take self-custody and how to manage your keys properly. I think it's literally one of the best um, places to store your money for the long run. Yeah, that's I, I think for for me one of the the things I've always looked at is the is the heart rate uh, yeah. uh, histories of, of crypto and seeing these massive gains and massive losses and and going do do I really want to jump into that? That just seems absolutely crazy. And then along with all of the, I, I feel like you can't go a week without hearing uh, some. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm going to use a crypto term, a rug pull mm -hmm. that that some cryptocurrency is uh, some token has been popularized by this group of people. Then we we're going to take all of our money and go home and, and go play somewhere else. I mean, that to me is the, the the scary stuff behind crypto. So we were talking a little bit about um, uh, exchanges and offshore and and regulated and maybe unregulated. Can we dive into a little bit about that as to what are the pros and cons of each of those? Sure. So, I mean, generally it's a red flag for me if uh, if a company is based offshore shore and offering all these different tokens or mm -hmm. issuing a, a native token to the website itself. So obviously maybe people were, were familiar with FTX yeah. and he issued his own token called FTT, uh, which was basically, you know, Sam Bankman freed coin and he issued <laughs> as much as he wanted and he gave a portion to his insiders at first. And, uh, and then a lot of, you know, a lot of times the price gets pumped and then dumped and a lot of people can lose uh, money on that sort of thing. So I try to avoid anything that is offshore and dealing with all these other tokens. You know, the biggest advice that I could give people is look for companies that are Bitcoin only because mm -hmm. they have made a, 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 they've chosen to focus on the one thing that has regulatory clarity and everything else. It, there's still so much uncertainty. What's going to happen with the SEC? Is Congress going to need to come in and, and pass a new law about digital assets? The, the truth is we don't know what's going to happen with a lot of these. And I would argue that many of them are not going to exist, especially if there's some sort of new framework in place that um, that makes it maybe the path more clear of how to register a digital security, which most of these are. So, you know, I would urge people to look for Bitcoin only companies. I ch I've chosen to bank only with Bitcoin only companies because I think that they take far less risk mm -hmm. and also look for companies that encourage you to self custody because that means they're not afraid of funds leaving their website. And they shouldn't be if their funds are backed one to one, right? If you're purchasing yeah. Bitcoin, that means they should have it on the back end. They shouldn't be doing anything like, you know, uh, leveraging it, lending it out, which is what a lot of these crypto companies were doing that are now, you know, no longer in existence. Yeah. Um, so those are some of the things to look for. A lot of these companies are um, regulated in the sense that some of them are already public companies that the SEC has kind of given a stamp of approval. But that doesn't mean that the tokens that are on these platforms mm -hmm. are going to be okay, because the SEC has filed many lawsuits. Um, so just just be careful. And I would I would recommend uh, Bitcoin Bitcoin only companies. So would one of the other warnings be uh, any exchange that is making any promise of returns on yeah. your investment? Yeah, you know, in fact, uh, when I was in investigating the FTX uh, saga, one of the things I came across was this deck that they presented to investors because they got billions of dollars from venture capital firms who, by the way, did no due diligence and didn't even, yeah. they signed on to give all this money without getting like a, a, a seat on the board or anything. <sighs> and And they promised in that deck Basically, you're gonna, you know, have 100% returns. I forgot the figure, but it was just like there should have been more questioning, especially by folks who deal with money and investing all the time. I mean, it's it's just surprising that they just kind of handed this amount of money to someone who is basically just, you know, what feels like a a, a college co-ed. Um, <laughs> yeah. And yeah, you have to be you have to be very very careful with something like that. You don't want them taking the customer funds and potentially commingling them, lending them out, and then promising you you know five, ten, sometimes more percent on the back end. Yeah, I was it, it, for me personally, it's always a red flag when someone is guaranteeing a return more than I can get on a on a money market account. Not to right. say that that's 
you know, 7% versus 5%. Oh my gosh. But yeah. anytime that someone's offering more than what the, than what a, you know, an order right. of magnitude more than what a bank does, it's like, hmm, something's, right. how, how are they able to do that when other institutions are? There's, there's, you know, there's risk involved, obviously. Exactly. Um, <laughs> there is no free lunch. <laughs> there is no free lunch. I like that. Um, is there any, do you think there's any more risk to using uh, exchanges that have just been spun up versus exchanges that have been around for, I, I wouldn't say decades, because I, th I think we're probably not multiple decades yet, but haven't been around, let's say, 10 years? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think you have to look at track record. And so... Um... Um, there are companies that exist that are already building legacies in this space and that you can tell will be around for a long time. Um, and there are others that, that are new. And I think that they will face the challenges of being a new company in the space and the competition involved and some will survive and some will fail. Um, that's the beauty of capitalism. But you do want to, I think, be careful with newer companies. Um, that's not to say that any any of them are you know definitely not going to work out because I'm, I'm sure there will be many, many new companies as this, this space grows and adoption grows, but I would always trust um, a company that's been around a little bit longer. Yeah, that, to me, that's one of the hallmarks that when someone comes to me and says, hey, I uh, I got approached by this person and, and uh, put my money in their app or their exchange and I go look at the domain name and, oh, the domain name was yeah. registered two weeks ago. And I'm like, oh, exactly. that's, well, and that's I mean, not good. If you look at the world of startups, there's thousands of businesses that start every single year and the majority of them, it, it doesn't work out, right? And they have to close shop rather quickly for yeah. most of them. Um, so I think longevity is something that actually should stand out. And this is different than the retail banking world where maybe there's a new bank that opens yeah. up, but it's connected to the Federal Reserve System and it's FDIC insured. So if something were to go wrong in that first year, well, uh, you have that insurance. Um, you don't have FDIC insurance in this space. So if you send someone money and you don't know exactly where it's going, be careful. When I was a reporter before I left that job and became a full-time uh, podcaster and content creator, I actually interviewed someone in the Los Angeles area who used uh, a website that I had never heard of for crypto. It was in the the company was in the United States, but they mm -hmm. were offering different tokens. And somehow someone from... Um, Asia access their account, even though they claimed to have two-factor authentication. Someone from, I believe it was Malaysia, somehow entered that person's account, drained it of all of the cryptocurrency, Ugh. which at the time was their entire life savings. They had about $30,000 in there. They were saving up for their children's graduation. I mean, it was it was a horrible story and the company couldn't do anything about it. Um, I reached out, I talked to their CEO and basically they said there was some sort of security breach. Uh, they don't know what happened, but the funds were moved and they're gone. They, they can't trace them. Oh yeah. That's, that's awful. To, that Those stories always just, uh, yeah, get to me when people lose life savings over no fault of their own. Yeah, it's horrible. Um, you were talking earlier about uh, self custody and why there's an advantage to like if I've got my crypt if I've got my Bitcoin on my device and it's not on the exchange that there's a level of security behind that. So what is uh, what is self custody and how does that work? Yeah. So, and you actually made me think of something. So many of the times when you purchase a uh, Bitcoin on a platform, that company might be a custodian or they might trust another custodian. Essentially mm -hmm. they're holding Bitcoin. You want to make sure that they've gone through some, you know, uh, accreditation, that they have certifications and audits in place. Uh, so a good custodian will have uh, completed something called a SAC one, which is essentially an audit that gives them a certification that, hey, people know that they're actually custodying this pretty safely. And there's, I, I believe, a SAC two level as well. Um, but the safest, if you're up for, you know, just learning a, a few extra steps is taking self custody, because the truly unique thing about Bitcoin is for the first time, we have a digital bearer instrument, you can mm -hmm. actually take Bitcoin into your own custody. And no one can seize it from you. No one can confiscate it from you. Because, um, you know, not that this is frequent, but we saw about a year and a half ago in Canada, the government was upset that people were donating to a trucker protest and yeah. they froze people's accounts, their banking accounts, yeah. and tried to go after the Bitcoin and crypto that they owned. And if you have your money on a platform, what if that company decides to say yes to the government's request to basically freeze all of your money? That's, I mean, that's the sort of dystopian fear that a lot mm -hmm. of people are starting to have. 
So if you have Bitcoin in self-custody, they can't do that because it's essentially the equivalent of having gold bullion in a vault. I mean, it's yours or, or cash under your mattress, wherever you store it. Um, so you, you want to be very careful about this process because if you are to lose your private keys, there might be no you know going back and, and reversing that. So basically, you can self-custody through a single SIG address, which would mm -hmm. be a one private key situation. I don't recommend that because that means it's a single point of failure. What I recommend is collaborative self-custody, which is more of a multi-signature scheme. We call it multi-sig. And, and that means you're basically creating a two out of three or a three out of five key setup. So I have a key, maybe someone I trust has a key, the company has a key, but you need two to come together to unlock your Bitcoin. So mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's not that the company with the one key can run away with your money. So it kind of, it just diffuses and distributes your risk, creates kind of multiple uh, surfaces so that you don't have just one attack vector. So that's what I recommend. And self-custody, I know it can seem intimidating, especially if you feel like you're not a technical person. That's how I was. It really isn't that scary or intimidating. It just takes a few steps to learn. And self-custody, like cold storage wallets, they're not harder to use than a hard drive. I yeah. mean, if you can use a hard drive and put files from one place to another, you can use a Bitcoin cold storage device. That's nice. I, I, I like that for those that are technically inclined. What about those that are not technically inclined and they, they want to get involved in Bitcoin, but the, they hear us talking about exchanges and are like, oh my gosh, that freaks me out. And yeah. no, I, I don't know what a USB drive is. And the last thing I want to do is to have to remember. Uh, sure. Yeah, I, I can't even remember the email, to my, the, the password to my email. Last thing I want to do is all my mm -hmm. money is tied up on a password. And if I forget it, are there other options that people can go to? I know, uh, I believe in January, the SEC approved some Bitcoin ETFs. Mm -hmm. Is that an alternative? Yeah. So first of all, if someone does not want to take self-custody and no matter how many, you know, how, how many of us are trying to convince them, they say, absolutely not. Um, I would just say that you have to be willing to accept the fact that there is going to be some counterparty risk mm -hmm. that you're taking on. Now, going back to what I mentioned about the custodians, you can decide to trust a custodian, let's say in the Bitcoin company where you purchased your Bitcoin, but make sure that that custodian, again, has been audited, has a track record so that you feel safe and comfortable putting your funds there. The other option, as you mentioned, are these new ETFs. They essentially wrap Bitcoin in this security wrapper. Uh, so it's very similar to owning a share of a stock or uh, a bond. Any, I mean, a lot of people are familiar with like the S&P index ETF, mm -hmm. um, SPY is the really popular one, or the gold ETFs. So that's absolutely an option. But just know that that is not owning Bitcoin. That means that the company, the issuer owns the Bitcoin mm -hmm. and they're giving you kind of a, a share, a certificate that says that you have a certain amount of ownership in like the, the wrap, wrapped version yeah. of Bitcoin. Um, there are fees involved. They're not very high. The issuers are actually competing right now and some of them even lowering their fees because they're all trying to race to get the the top spot for liquidity and flows. Um, but, you know, it's just it's not the same as owning Bitcoin in the same way that a gold ETF is not the same as owning yeah. physical gold. So you just have to be willing to take on that risk. Um, and someone had a very funny comment online, and I, I'm going to try to remember exactly what it is. But honestly, it's very similar. It, 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 this person wrote that owning an ETF is similar to uh, having a girlfriend, but you don't you don't see her in person. <laughs> She's she's in BlackRock or whatever, whichever company's apartment there and they're essentially getting paid by you to watch her and they're sending you a photo of her every month. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that, that was funny. It sounds a little bit like uh, foreign brides. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought it was a really it was a funny analogy because essentially, yes, they have the Bitcoin. They're watching the Bitcoin and they're yeah. giving you a little, uh, you know, a little receipt saying that you own a portion of this, but it's it's not taking self custody. It's not the same. Yeah, <laughs> there, there was oh, one other thing I was thinking of as we were talking a little bit. And I hear people often talk about Bitcoin as and more wider uh, cryptocurrency as uh, it, it's a, a financial privacy in that you can transact without anyone knowing who you are and what you're transacting with now. 
blockchain is a record, so <laughs> uh, there are some privacy issues there. So where do we kind of fall on is should people be looking at Bitcoin as a privacy move or is it not a privacy move? So this is a really fascinating topic. It has many layers and nuances. I would say that Bitcoin offers more privacy than almost any other monetary technology. It's not perfect. It's mm -hmm. not completely anonymous. It is pseudonymous. So if someone does know what wallet address is associated with a certain individual, then they can track a lot of movements of money, which is one of the reasons why we in the Bitcoin space get frustrated that people say that, oh, it's only used for illicit activity, because the truth is, um, I believe last year, $900 million were were uh, used for illicit activity in the dollar fiat world, the retail mm -hmm. banking world, whereas 900,000 were used for nefarious illicit activities in Bitcoin. So very, very big uh, difference. And one of the reasons is it is sort of easier to track if you know what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. There are probably going to be better and better forensic and um, analysts and uh, investigators for, for blockchain as we go forward. But I do, I am also passionate about the privacy aspect because um, you don't want all these corporations and companies to basically monitor all, all of what you're spending money on yeah. and then try to sell you ads. I mean, I just think that there, there hasn't been anything truly private within the financial world since cash. Um, Bitcoin helps us, you know, get a step closer to that. But as soon as, you know, everyone starts monitoring everything, then you sort of lose that, which is why Bitcoiners are working on tools, uh, especially in secondary layers to try to create more financial privacy, because they don't want everything to be monitored mm -hmm. and surveilled. And right now, the, one of the problems in our current system and why, you know, Bitcoin is so great is to send an, any meaningful amount of money today, especially if you're sending it internationally, yeah. you have to go through an intermediary. You have to go through a bank, which is ultimately a corporation. It's tied to the government. And they see exactly where that money's going, what you're spending it on, how you use it. Everything is monitored and surveilled and tracked. And it takes days actually to settle on the back end. You might swipe your you know, credit card yeah. at the coffee shop, but that doesn't mean that the that, that Starbucks or wherever you're going gets that money immediately. It actually takes days, sometimes even weeks to settle. So there are a lot of frictions and all the corresponding banks. That system is ultimately very fragile. Most of the dollars that are in existence don't actually exist. They're not physical. They're yeah. mostly just credit debt. So, you know, I think it'll be interesting to watch how this evolves because I do think that there's going to be a lot of pushback um, from governments to want to clamp down and not have financial privacy. So I think we need to counter that. I think think there's going to be a large movement to potentially limit self-custody or ban it. I think we need to push back against that. So this is a very evolving space. And I think um, the more that people know, the more that they'll be empowered to educate their politicians or themselves, you know, be out there with political advocacy work, because we want to make sure that when someone is passing a law, they understand this space and they're thoughtful about it. So you don't remove people's freedoms. Yeah. And one of the things I was, uh, we had been uh, talking kind of around is if the exchange is incorporated and a company is in the U.S., uh, do they have to apply, uh, uh, apply the same banking laws in terms of know your customer? Yeah, I believe most of the exchanges that operate here in the U.S., uh, they have to be KYC. Like you mentioned, it's know your customer. So very similar to the process of opening up a regular bank account. They take certain information from you. Now, some people are totally fine with that. And they're like, you know, this is not dissimilar from opening up a regular bank account or how the process works of owning shares in a company or buying a house. You know, there are a lot of disclosures, a lot of information's out there. Other people in the space hate that. You know, they want that to change. They don't want it to be know your customer. They want it to be as private as possible. I will say that, you know, most people are compliant. They're not trying to commit crimes. Uh, it's unfortunate that so many times we see lawmakers want to remove people's freedoms and yeah. privacy for this tiny percentage of what bad actors have done. I think that's awful. And it's just an excuse to, you know, um, gain more control and clamp down on, on, on the rights of people. And I I'm against that. Um, but you know, KYC is something that a lot of people have gotten used to within the retail mm -hmm. banking world. And most of the companies 
in the space are KYC, which means which means that they do know how much Bitcoin that you're purchasing. Um, this is going to get interesting, right? Yeah. Because <laughs> let's say let's say that they do ban self custody or they do something like they're going to tax Bitcoin at some crazy amount. I mean, technically, again, if the the government, let's say, subpoenas or requests information from these companies who need to be compliant and mm -hmm. and they're regulated, well, they could potentially know. Okay, well, uh, John Smith purchased five Bitcoin on this platform. We don't know where it is now, but yeah. he bought five Bitcoin. So we're just going to assume he has five Bitcoin and we're <laughs> going to send him a tax bill. I mean, that's something that's not impossible, right? Yeah. Um, I think that if if they were to attack self custody, also there might be a few hoops to jump through in order to get the Bitcoin back onto an exchange. Because again, if these exchanges are receiving Bitcoin from somewhere they don't know where it's from, they are contacted by uh, agencies like the IRS. I'll, I have an example of that. I know uh, someone who mined a lot of Bitcoin very very early on, so they mined it right. Mining Bitcoin is non KYC. Yeah. So they wanted to sell some of it because they had a lot. They wanted to, you know, see some of that profit invested in a house or I don't know what they were buying, but they moved it onto an exchange and mm -hmm. immediately that set off a flag. Uh, I believe the IRS contacted the company or maybe it was just during the yearly check and they said, where did these funds come from? And so the customer, my friend, was contacted by the exchange and he had to answer, like, where did these funds come from? And he said, I, I was a miner really early. I mined it and that's how I got it. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I think they, I think at this point they're just taking you for your word, but it's just going to, it's going to be very interesting to see how this evolves and people should expect that there's going to be, you know, government actors and people who are in positions of power who want to know everything that's happening in this space. I, I, I could see that being very challenging to, if, if your friend was put in the position where I need you to prove that you that you mine these bitcoins. Yeah. Show us the purchases for the hardware that you use to do it. It's yeah. like, well, I didn't know I would need that yeah. five, 10 years ago. I, mm -hmm. I didn't know about that. Do you, you want my electric bills? <laughs> right, <laughs> right. What, what do you want to see as proof? That, well, could, that and, could get really messy. And I don't know if you saw this, but there's also a move by lawmakers today to ban coin mixers. So mm -hmm. for privacy reasons, again, because imagine if we lived in a world where literally you could just track how much everyone was worth. That's a very scary world, right? Yeah. People people could have significant security risks. Um, and and Bitcoin, if you again, if you know the addresses or if you, if there's information that's compromised in some way, you could potentially be walking around and someone knows exactly how much you have. So um, there's been pushback against something called coin mixers or coin joins, which is essentially a tool that some people use to, you know, send their Bitcoin in and then a, a different address basically comes out so that you don't really know it gets mixed. Like if uh -huh. you were to put coins in a jar, right, mix it up and then hand them back out because um, it's fungible. So I'm curious to see what will happen in that realm, too, because I don't think that most people who are putting their Bitcoin into coin mixers are trying to commit a crime or doing it to be illicit. They're doing it to be more private. And yeah. there's already pushback with that. Yeah, it, it, it's it's I, I think it's the knee jerk reaction uh, of if someone's wanting privacy, they must be wanting to do something wrong. Right, right, and that's exactly. and, and we we know that that's not true, but that's kind of uh, that is often the knee jerk reaction. That yeah. is that people want privacy because they want to do something bad, which right. you know, that's it's, not the case. Exactly. Well, and and I I've said before actually at some of the the talks I've given that privacy is different from secrecy. Privacy is really just about protecting yourself mm -hmm. and your information, and and everyone has a right to privacy. Secrecy is you're trying to hide something. Right. And and there may be legitimate reasons why you'd want to hide something, but there's a difference. And I think that government sometimes looks at this the second and says everyone wants to hide from us. It's not that we just want privacy. Yeah. I, I want to transition over to to talking about kind of on the on the, on the scam side of things and, and ask you some questions about that. So obviously okay. you've got a you've got a you've got a social media presence where you're talking, yeah. You know, specifically about Bitcoin, but broadly about cryptocurrency. I, I've seen so many scams where either people are impersonating uh, uh, content creators or uh, 
getting in the comments section and promoting stuff, what should people be watching out for in terms of how to identify posters and scams in the comments and things like that? Yes, be very, very, very careful. Uh, for those of us who are public facing and have a larger following, there are a ton of impersonators. Um, you know, frankly, I've been really frustrated with some of these social media platforms because I report them and sometimes they don't take these profiles down. Uh, I have an impersonator right now on TikTok that has amassed more than 180,000 followers. I've reported them multiple times to TikTok. Uh, other, other people have as well. And the account still continues to DM people and try to take money. No. So first of all, none of us are going to ask you for your money. We might be there with like recommendations for certain platforms or promo codes you could use, but we're never going to say, hey, send me money. So that's a huge red flag. I, I urge people to look for verification badges. So on Twitter, I have my blue check mark. On Instagram, I have a blue check. Everything that is legitimate has a blue check. That means that the person is verified as the who they say they are, whereas mm -hmm. all the impersonators obviously can't get that because they can't send in, you know, my driver's license to prove yeah. that they're me. Um, and, and, and just be careful when someone says that they're going to send you money. There are a ton of bots that are spinning up that are pretending to be Michael Saylor, who is one of the biggest personalities in this space, and basically saying something like, if you send me one Bitcoin, I'll send you two. And he he has a team that is working on taking those down. And the oh. second that they do, two more pop up. So it's a game of whack-a-mole. So just be really careful. If someone's DMing you, asking you to help, you know, can I help with your investment strategy? No. <laughs> just report, 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 especially if they don't have that blue check mark. Um, some of the platforms uh, I just choose not to really even use or engage with because it, I can't get a verification. Mm -hmm. So for example, I'm not active on Telegram. I've used it a couple times here and there with people who only have that as a platform, but there are like, I don't know, a hundred Natalie Brunels on no. Telegram. And one, one thing that's sad is they have messaged people and extracted money from them. Uh, I remember getting a phone call once, uh, actually a, a Twitter message saying, hey, you know, where are you? We were excited to hear you come talk. <laughs> and I was in New York City at the time for a Fox uh, business shoot. And I go, I have no idea what you're talking about. And they said, oh my God, we we thought we were talking to you on Telegram. We booked you oh. to come speak here. So they booked me as a speaker <laughs> oh and it goodness. was it was some fake person, right? And uh, and again, if you send it to a crypto address, you're not getting that money ba back. You can't call Chase Bank and say, reverse that. You know, that was an accident. Your money's gone. So just be very, very careful. And I'm glad you're shining a spotlight in this because these platforms need to do something. There are too many of these bots and fake accounts and impersonators. In, in terms of you talked about once you once you send your Bitcoin to someone, the, there's no uh, there's no oopsie button. There's no undo. Um, I've seen yeah. a lot in the comments about uh, people uh, promising recovery of, of cryptocurrency. Any thoughts on that? Um, so there are, I, I've interacted with some companies that are uh, trying to help recover people's funds and they do sort of that forensic analysis mm -hmm. of blockchains to try to trace where the money went, Some sometimes successfully, which is amazing. Um, but oftentimes it's just too difficult because they've, they've shot off to an address that no one knows who it's affiliated with overseas. So, um, you know, the chances of getting your money back if you sent it to someone and they basically just closed that address and sent it somewhere else and I, they, they're they basically not responding to you. It's just, it's very, it's very difficult because again, it's not a situation where if someone takes your credit card, you call Chase Bank and you say that there was a you know fraud situation and they close that account and reverse the charge. This is instant settlement. This mm -hmm. is your money literally moving on a public blockchain that is global, that is permissionless, that is borderless. The second that you send it to that address, it will settle in the next, you know, max 10 minutes. Um, and it could, if you didn't send it to the right place, you might never get it back. It's sort of like uh, coming up to someone on the street and saying, are you Bob? And they say, yeah, you hand them a big stack of change and they walk away. Yeah. And you later find out that, that wasn't really Bob. Yeah, you're, you're kind of out of luck, and yes, it, unless someone's got cameras and and a whole bunch of other stuff, they're not going to be able to find out who that Bob was. So anyone claiming, right. oh, I can get your money back from Bob, probably not, uh, 
probably not real. Yeah. I mean, I have a friend right now who actually, he clicked on some sort of malware um, and he had on his desktop a folder that contained uh, some of his seed phrases and private keys. Oh no. And because he clicked on that link, the hacker was able to access and see everything on his computer. Uh, and so he took that information and they took the money. And so he contacted one of these companies and they've been trying to get the funds back, but they can't track them. Oh, that that's awful. I, yeah. uh, I remember an interview I did with someone and his position was, I have my computer that I do all my day-to-day -day stuff on. And yeah. then I have another computer that I do my finances on. Mm -hmm. And the only thing I do on that computer is finances. And when it's, if I'm, and it's powered off, unless I'm actively doing something, I don't have, there's no email on it. There's absolutely nothing else on that machine because mm -hmm. he just wanted that extra space between finances and regular life. I mean, you're lucky if you can do that, right? I yeah. mean, certainly if you can <laughs> afford a second computer, absolutely. Why not have one that is completely offline? Don't ever connect it to Wi-Fi. Uh, in fact, I've done tutorials. Um, there are ways of doing something called an air gapped uh, cold storage wallet. Mm -hmm. I have a tutorial if anyone wants to go to my YouTube page, Coin Stories or Natalie Brunel, and I show you how to essentially move funds on or off your cold storage device never connecting that device to the internet. That device is never hooked up to anything connected to Wi-Fi or any type of internet. So there are ways to protect yourself. Obviously, it takes a little bit of extra technical know-how and steps. Um, if you are able to, to have devices like phones or computers that aren't attached to the internet, great. I think a lot of people obviously can't afford to do that. You just really want to be careful. This isn't like losing a password and yeah. then at requesting from the company to re restore your password. This is this is your life savings. You actually you want to take those extra next steps, which is one of the reasons why I highly recommend collaborative self custody because it puts you in a position where if something happens with one key, no problem. And again, you could set up a two out of three key scenario or three out of five. There are so many options with that, so you can disperse and diffuse any sort of risk. And I personally think that's the best way because it has no counterparty risk. That's the beauty of Bitcoin. In its purest form, when you take mm -hmm. self-custody, the bearer instrument has no counterparty risk. You don't have to trust anybody. It's trustless. Um, if you do decide that you want to trust a, a company, you just want to make sure to do your homework, do your research, yeah. <laughs> where you actually trust them because we have had the the FTXs and the same ba Bankman Freeds in this world, and he's not the last one. Yeah. So in your mind, do you, um, would you recommend people kind of even, okay, let me take a step back here. Uh, the general financial advice to people is um, uh, diversify. So you, maybe you have some of this, some of that, uh, some real estate, stocks, bonds, cash, uh, all sorts of stuff. Do you recommend people diversify even within Bitcoin in the sense of have some here, have some there uh, to split up your risk or, does, or is in your mind does that just create more risk and more headache? Well, I mean, it definitely creates more hurdles. Um, the other thing I think people should be aware of, and this is probably too, uh, we could get on a very long conversation about this. I've done um, some shows about this. Someday, you know, Bitcoin, the blockchain, was built beautifully in optimizing for security and decentralization. There's a certain size to the blocks to keep it, you know, on a certain time schedule and issuance schedule. But that means that it can only fit so many transactions. So mm -hmm. you may have heard in this space, right, this idea, well, Bitcoin's slow. Bitcoin is slow, even though it's not, <laughs> for, for a reason, because it's secure and it's meant so that... Um, the only way you can have decentralization is if everyone can run a node. Like literally anyone in the world can power up a very basic computer and download the whole ledger, which is the mm -hmm. blockchain. And so that's what Bitcoin was designed for, so that you don't have to be some massive corporation with a ton of capital or a massive warehouse full of computers in order to run the ledger because each block has so many transactions yeah. packed into it. Literally anyone can do it. 
But that means that Bitcoin is not just scarce in the amount of units that it has, 21 million. Bitcoin is also actually scarce in that the block space is finite. So as more people adopt Bitcoin, there's going to be a greater and greater competition to fit in one of those blocks, each mm -hmm. of your transactions, which means that fees will go up. It's one of the reasons why people are building on layers and something like the Lightning Network to facilitate faster payments. But it ultimately does mean that Bitcoin on the base layer, maybe 10 years from now, it could potentially be too expensive for the average person to transact. Mm -hmm. So what you don't want to create is a situation where you have all these, they're called UTXOs, they're unspent transactions. Um, all these UTXOs, you know, you've got one here, one here, one there, and all of a sudden to move just a single one of them costs you a couple hundred dollars, right? So the more that you can consolidate UTXOs, the better. Um, if you have everything in one address that's split into multiple keys, I think that's the safest and the most efficient route. Mm -hmm. Because if something happens and, you know, then you only need one base chain transaction, you don't need to do a hundred of them. Yeah. I mean, some people for some people don't realize that they have like hundreds of UTXOs that they've created. You know, that, that's going to be very expensive potentially for them. And I know we're getting sort of in the weeds. I don't want people to feel overly intimidated, but it, it, it's just think of Bitcoin as being built sort of in layers. It, the base chain is the bedrock. It is like the granite under Central Park. You want it to be as strong and fortified and eternal as possible, which it is. And then you can build on top of it in these different layers that optimize for privacy, optimize for speed, um, which is the beauty of Bitcoin. But no, I don't recommend creating a bunch of different addresses and keys. <laughs> good advice. Good advice. Um, so if people want to learn more about Bitcoin, what kind of uh, trainings do you have available? What kind of information do you have available? Sure. So um, I have a podcast that I update two times a week. One is a short news update, which is about 10 minutes long. And another is more of a long form interview where we get into all sorts of topics related to Bitcoin and the economy. It's called Coin Stories. It's mm -hmm. on YouTube and every audio platform. We get uh, more than a million listens per month, which is really exciting. I'm also very active on X at Nat Brunel, but look for the blue check mark. Um, and then I'm going to be putting out some really great educational material very soon, uh, focusing on that sort of 101 intro to Bitcoin content, because again, I really want to focus on getting more of the general audience feeling comfortable yeah. investing, because at this point, you should be off zero, have at least 1% to 2% of your wealth, your savings in Bitcoin. Otherwise, you're going to miss out on the biggest asymmetric opportunity of the of your life. Um, Bitcoin is an incredible savings technology. That's what, what it's meant for. Mm -hmm. It's not to be looked at every single day. You don't check the price of your house every day, do you? You don't like check it on Zillow daily. Uh, no, it's your long-term savings tool. And uh, I'm really excited to help people better understand it. That's awesome. We'll make sure to link to all the uh, the verified, uh, yeah. uh, all your verified platforms you. uh, so people can get to the right place. Natalie, thank you. thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Thank you so much for having me.